But we drive about two and a half, three hours out to this spot. And it's right about five o'clock. They're just closing up. But we go in and it's basically two guys in there. And it's obvious that they have their own sides of the warehouse. So there's a guy named John Hilliard. We used to call him the troll because he literally looked like a troll. I mean, he's like got the dirtiest face. He had these locks. They were just like, he just looked like he had bathed in just like forever. And then on the other side, it was a guy we called the Nazi. And we called him the Nazi because he had swastikas all over himself. Literally, I mean, it was ill. It was like the illest shit ever. So we get in there and the dude is like closing the door. And we're like, can we just come in and just, you know, check out a couple of records? We came all the way down here. Dude says, I don't give a f where you came from. We're closed. Slams the door. So we're looking in the window, man, and we see like sealed copies of like Baby Huey. Rows and boxes and boxes and boxes still stacked to the ceiling of like 45s, everything. It's like we came all this way. You know what I'm saying? We, we literally reached the promised land. You know what I mean? And we had to drive back. So we came back the next day and that was it. That was all she wrote. I mean, we went in there, dude, and, and this is in college. I mean, I spent whole student loan checks in that place, man. Peace, I'm Chief XL from Black Alicia's Quantum Control. Right now you're checking out Crate Kid. This record right here, uh, a buddy of mine in Paris actually bought a warehouse that EMI used to own. I think he said there was probably about four or 500,000 pieces in the warehouse. A lot of crap, but this particular record um, was a record that the BBC produced for this show uh, back in the day. But it's, it's ill because they have this, the dialogue from the show and then they have these just really bizarre but dope kind of soulful breakdowns and themes that go in between the dude talking. The funny thing about the record though is that he does it in English and you know, he's English so the English is cool, but when he does it in French, you know, all my French friends laugh at it because he it says it's just corny. This is another record to where just looking at it, I mean, I wouldn't have imagined that this record would be dope. So. <laughs> I first got exposed to records from my pops. My dad was a record collector. In Berkeley, up on Telegraph, used to be a record store called Leopold's. And that was like the mecca for black music. You know, anything sold, you could get it. So pops would take me up there when he was going to look for his Earth, Wind & Fire records. I think um, the first record I ever bought was uh, Uncle Jam on Shoe by Parliament Funkadelic. Pops would play Parliament and whatnot. It wasn't like I was a super big fan, but I was just intrigued by the cover. You know what I mean? You had this dude with these huge boots on and he was like doing the Uncle Sam thing, but in the silver, it was just, it just looked ill to me. You know, after that, after I bought that record, I would just go with him pretty much every week. This first one is called Soul Food by Frankie C.A and the Soul Riders. It's on a label called Tropical, uh, which was a Miami label. At the time that I found it, it was really, really sought after. I found about five copies of it, and um, it's produced some really good trades for me. This has been a very lucrative find. I think I was digging out in, in Richmond, Virginia, um, way back when. This is another example of, at the time, um, I had never seen this label before, Tropical. So, and then you see something in the title of Soul Food by Frankie C.A. and the Soul Riders. It's like, yeah, I was thinking, I'll check it out. So, so yeah, it's like the drums on this are like the kind of drums that I like. I never get rid of records. I just keep collecting storage units. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, I got to a certain point to where I, I stopped counting and then I got to a certain point to where I started feeling like bragging about how many records you have is kind of like bragging about how much money you have. It's not really good etiquette. You know what I'm saying? So I just kind of 
to say I've been filling up a lot of units. So we're here at one of four storage units. This is a bunch of catalog. It's pretty much every genre of records. I kind of split everything up alphabetically. Um, I'll have things that I classify just as catalog and then everything else is rap and hip hop records. So over the past, I guess, maybe about 10 years, I've had a team of about six, six, five, six, seven interns who've consistently worked to kind of alphabetize everything for me. Um, all of this stuff is going to be going into one master space that I'm building over the summer. Um, so I'll combine everything from all the different units. So yeah, this is uh, one of the vaults. So, and in here is just it's miscellaneous stuff. Uh, fresh out of Borstel. This is a dope rock record kind of psych kind of thing. Dope drums. Um, one of my favorite records for drums. This is really, really dope. A little bit of country. Cut was actually the first person to really put me up on um, drums on country records. He's like, yo, Tulsa turnaround, man. Don't sleep. Kenny Rogers. Uh, this is a really dope Brazilian record. Azimuth on some Libre. Some Libre is one of my favorite uh, Brazilian labels. Uh, actually, yeah, I did get this in Brazil. You know, again, Pops' collection was real diverse. So, you know, I'd already known about rock records. I'd known about African records, Afrobeat records. You know what I mean? I know that was my introduction to Fela and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So I knew all that stuff early on, but in terms of really infusing it into my production, I probably say that happened right around the time um, that I first met Lyrics Born, uh, Asia Born. He was Asia Born at that time. Also, DJ Zen uh, and DJ Shadow. That was all like early 90s, when we were, like our freshman year in college. I was just inspired by those cats. You know what I mean? It was literally, we were in school, but we were really in school. You know, we were the program directors down at the at, at KDVS, which was the, the campus radio station. At that time, they, they had probably one of the biggest collections of one of the biggest libraries of any, you know, radio station in the nation. You know, we were always just studying. You know, if it wasn't in our collection, we were listening, we were going down to the radio station and, and listening to stuff. Everything at that time had revolved around DJ Zen because he had um, a midnight to three uh, radio show. Uh, Shadow would come down there and play. He would debut like whatever like mix he was doing for KML at that time. He would play a first on, on, on Jeff's show. You know, me and Tom lyrics born would just we we would go down there. We would play. Um, Jeff would have a, a a name that sample segment of the show. So we would just go down there with breaks and just try to you know always try to just try to blow people's minds with stuff where stuff came from. It's had to biggest, most monumental impact, you know what I mean? That's where, you know, my musical vocabulary started. You know, I didn't have uh, any formal training on anything, you know, but to this day, all of my reference points come from things that I've collected. Records are as vital to me as books are to any college professor. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's the, the more you have, the, the bigger your vocabulary is, the bigger your knowledge is, the bigger your musical intelligence becomes. Australia record. Jack Purnell and the Big Band Show. He does uh, covers. He's a drummer and singer. But this is a, a, a dope record with a sample that I, I, I paid a good amount of money to clear so we can talk about this. I got a record called Burning House. Um, with a guy named Hervé Salters who plays keys on a lot of my records. We put it out in France back in October. So we got a song called The Nightbird and we use this. And yeah, it's a good record. This right here, um, Shine Heads, Rough and Rugged. It's a dope record. He's got uh, a cover on here uh, with Billie Jean and the, the drums on here are really, 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 really sick. Like really dope. 
Like when I came up on this, I was like, shine head, word. I got this in Rotterdam. Yep. I remember how much the most I spent on a record when I didn't have any money. You know what I mean? That's, 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 ask me that. Cause when you have money and you spend money on records, it's like, okay, well, it's just part of the trade. It's tools of the trade. But when you don't have it, that's when you're sacrificing. And I was actually in New York with Automator at this time. He had, um, he was the first person to take me by, uh, I think it was A1 that we went to. I was in there and I was really, really, really into library records at that time. There was a, a, a library record that was a, um, it was like an Afro fusion rock record that they had up on the wall. And I hadn't seen it and I needed it to complete my collection. I probably had like maybe 500 bucks to my name at that time. And I, I go in there and the dude in there was like, he, he was kind of, he, he was trying to treat me like a herd, man, when I was in there. Cause I was asking about the record, he's like, hey, you know that record is $300. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, give it to me. <laughs> I put my car down and I came home from New York. And yeah, I, I, I struggled the rest of that month, but I got the record, man. So the ill thing is that I got multiple copies of it now. How fucked up is that? You know what I mean? Records, man. This is uh, one of my favorite gospel joints, Danny Bells. But this is actually one of my favorite uh, prestige joints. Uh, it's called World Around the Sun by Bayete, um, who was formerly known as Todd Cochran. Cochran. Um, you know, Prestige is, is a local label because um, it was uh, distributed by Fantasy, which was based here, obviously, you know, in, 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 in Berkeley. So the, the thing that's so amazing about records, man, is every record has a story. We used to always sit and trip off the fact that if you go into a record store, in those bins are just thousands and thousands of stories, dreams that came true, dreams that were shattered, you know what I mean? Tragedy, triumph, all of those kind of things. This record here, um, Blackout, is still pretty sought after, really rare. Um, there's actually a great story behind this record. We copped maybe, I want to say about 10 of these. Uh, it was me, Shadow, and B+. Plus. The geniuses that we were decided to go to Oklahoma City in the dead of winter. Have you ever been to Oklahoma City in the winter? We drive through an ice store, black ice on the highway. We're on the way to where we hear this record is, and the car just starts skidding, and he just starts doing donuts. B pulls over and he's like, this. I'm gonna wreck my car behind some records? I'm going home. <laughs> but after he calmed down, he was like, he kind of, we got him back gung-ho on the mission again. And uh, yeah, we went and found these. This is on a label called Century Records. Century Records, um, they, they basically printed and distributed um, a lot of like high school records back in the day, also a lot of gospel records as well. At this time, they were based in Oklahoma City, um, but they would later, I think they later had plants in like LA and other places and whatnot, but yeah, Blackout, this is, this is a gem. I think there'll be always something that um, has not been swallowed up by technology. There's always gonna be that record that there was only 200 records made of. There's always gonna be that private press kind of thing. Now, with technology, everything is, is so, easy, you know what I mean? And we live in such an ADD age um, that I can understand people just wanting things at their fingertips, whatever, but once you get into this art form and, and this sport, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing to where to, to be in it is to really value it and, and see what it is. Benny B used to call me all the time. He, he called me and said, man, you know how much this clown just paid for stark reality? And I would just in the back of my mind say, 
damn, I don't ever want to be that dude that somebody's calling and, and, and saying, you know, you know how much you pay.